So there are five R's of any optic disc evaluation. This first we measure the scleral ring. Then comes the neuroretinal rim. Then comes the retinal nerve fiber layer. Then the retinal or the optic disc hemorrhages, and then the region of peripapillary atrophy. Now many of you all won't understand what these terms are and what they look like. So I'll I'll break them up into the, each individual parts and I'll explain it to you. So the scleral ring. So when we look at an optic disc, the outermost ring that you see in the optic disc, this is the part of the uh, optic nerve that has pierced through the sclera to enter into the eye. So that outermost rim is known as the scleral ring. It is used to measure the absolute size of the optic nerve head. So now, why is the absolute size of the optic nerve head important? So the the population of the world is so varied and it's there's so much variety in races in countries and different localities of india itself that everyone has a different there's a range of different scleral ring sizes and how does that matter the big so people who have a bigger scleral ring which means they have a bigger optic nerve cross section they will also have a larger cup so sometimes to a lay person or to a stu or to a ophthalmology or optometry student that large cup might be misinterpreted as a glaucomatous cup but if you see that the scleral ring is large you should always expect that the cup will also be large therefore it's important to first measure the scleral ring then decide whether the cupping is too large or too small for that corresponding scleral ring so the outermost extent of your optic nerve head where the where the white area ends that is known as the scleral ring here you can see it marked as the with the two green lines and this is the basic uh, scleral ring size so how to measure it basically you shine the the slit lamp beam on the optic nerve head as i had mentioned in my video and this slit lamp has a measuring tool where you can vary the size of the slit beam vertically and the slit lamp measures the amount that that vertical beam measures in terms of millimeters so we have to make sure that the slit beam is exactly uh, the same vertical height as the top of the scleral ring and the bottom and then we read the values over here and that is your scleral rim width except that when we use lenses like 90d and 78d the lens itself magnifies the image for us so there is a magnification factor so whatever value you get on the slit lamp you have to multiply it by these factors so if you are using a 9890d you have to uh, multiply that number by 1.33 because the 90d will actually make the image slightly smaller and if you use a 78d you have to multiply that number by 1.2 and very rarely who be, for the people who use 60d you have to multiply it by 0.88 and if you use a super field uh, lens then it's a 1.5 so these ma this magnification factor is important when you're measuring the scleral ring now most of us will use a 78 or a 90d so just remember these two values next element is the neuroretinal rim so basically the retinal nerve fibers the way they are arranged on over the retina is that each individual retinal nerve fiber from all the points of the retina they flow in one direction they flow towards the optic nerve and then they enter into the optic nerve as you can see in this textbook uh, diagram it enters into the optic nerve and in through the optic nerve it goes and it reaches the brain through the optic uh, through the optic pathway now this is very similar to a sinkhole which you see in lakes and uh, ponds through which water is being is is seeping through the way the water falls through the sinkhole is very similar to the way the retinal nerve fibers fall through the optic nerve and they go through the optic nerve into the brain so as you can see in this sinkhole there's a central central black area which corresponds to the cup of the optic nerve and there's a surrounding area where the water is falling in the so that corresponding area is the neuroretinal rim which is basically the nerve the nerve fibers going into the optic nerve 
so now the thickness of the neuroretinal rim which is the part of the uh, optic nerve through which the optic nerve fibers are falling into the optic nerve this the thickness of this neuroretinal rim gives us an indication to how healthy the nerve fiber layer in that particular area is so if you have a thick neuroretinal rim you know that there are a good number of nerve fibers entering into the optic nerve in that corresponding area so you know that the nerve fiber layer in that area is good and it's healthy and it's the patient doesn't have glaucoma however when there is thinning of this neuroretinal rim you know that less new nerve fibers are entering the optic nerve there and one of the reasons could be glaucoma because glaucoma causes damage to the nerve fibers so the neuroretinal rim is very important to measure and that is seen as this yellowish part of the optic nerve which is the outer yellowish band on the optic nerve it's a concentric yellowish band around the opti uh, optic nerve cup and the cup is seen as a whitish area and the nrr or the neuroretinal rim is this yellowish area now the neuroretinal rim thickness follows something known as the isn't rule so what is the isn't rule basically it's that it means that the inferior neuroretinal rim i should be thicker than the superior neuroretinal rim s which should be thicker than the nasal neuroretinal rim n which should be thicker than the temporal neuroretinal rim t so as long as the optic nerve is following the isn rule where the thickness is in this uh, is in the isnt uh, pattern you know that the optic nerve is healthy however in glaucoma this isn rule goes for a toss sometimes you have the superior rim thicker than the inferior or the temporal thicker than the nasal or the nasal is thicker than the inferior so any time that the isn rule is broken you have to suspect that there is some neuroretinal rim thinning in that particular quadrant so now coming to the vertical cup disc ratio so in glaucoma this is a very important parameter to measure when we are evaluating the disc it's also called the vcdr vertical cup disc ratio so now how is this measured so earlier i told you about measuring the scleral ring that is the absolute size of the optic nerve and then so that is known as the disc size then we have the central cup area now the size of the cup in relationship to the size of the entire disc is your cup disc ratio and here you can see that in smaller discs where the disc diameter is less than 1 a normal cup disc ratio would be somewhere around 0.2 to 0.26 which means that the cup should be uh, in relationship to the disc it should be only 0.2 however in large uh, disc of more than 2 mm you can even have a cup disc ratio of 0.55 therefore it's very important to measure the scleral ring because in large disc you can have a large cup of 0.55 cup disc ratio whereas in a small disc 0.26 is what the normal value is so if you have a 0.5 cup disc ratio in a small disc you know that this is glaucoma but that's not the same for a larger disc another way of measuring the neuroretinal rim thickness is known as the ddls scale which is the disc damage likelihood scale basically here they measure the rim to disc ratio they don't measure the uh, they don't measure the cup to disc ratio they measure the, the cup is ignored in this parameter the rim is the more important one and they have classified this very accurately therefore it is very easy to represent and to uh, when we have patients following up over 2 2 months if the if the optic disc evaluation is following the ddls scale then it is easy to measure any progression whereas if in the vcdr scale it's very subjective it's subjective between doctors between the same doctor also you can have a subjective difference but the ddls scale is very exact now i don't think the webinar will permit me to explain each point of the ddls scale because it's mainly very theoretical but i would recommend everyone to go through it it's extremely easy to understand and it's extremely useful in the opd setup so i would recommend you all all to go through this ddls page in fact take a screenshot of your mobile or something with this page on it and uh, remember it i mean you this is something you have to just mug up then moving on to the rnfl the retinal nerve fiber layer so as i mentioned every point of the retina throws out a retinal nerve fiber 
which makes its way to the optic nerve and it flows through the optic nerve into the brain so the the entire top layer of the retina consists of retinal nerve fibers and this is known as the retinal nerve fiber layer and this usually is densest in the superior and the inferior part of the retina because as i mentioned the superior and inferior neuroretinal rim is also the thickest so that means maximum uh, nerve fibers are falling in from the superior and the inferior parts of the retina that that doesn't mean that the temporal and the nasal parts don't have any nerve fibers it's just that they're a little scanty and they're less so every time we look at a retina and we see this glistening retina shining back at us we should always make sure that the superior part of the retina is glistening whiter than the temporal and the nasal part and so is the inferior part the inferior part should also be glistening whiter than the temporal and nasal so the basic pattern should be glistening white glistening dark glistening white glistening dark as we move concentrically anti clockwise however if any of this if this pattern is broken like you can see over here it should be glistening white glistening dark glistening white but there is a where there is a nerve fiber layer defect over here that's why inferiorly also it's it's not glistening it's dark over here so you can notice that there is a wedge shaped defect in the nerve fiber and it will correspondingly lead to a nerve neuroretinal rim notch over here because less nerve fibers are going in from here over here in the image on the right you can see a more magnified version of the same thing here you can see a drop out area of nerve fibers so basically due to the pressure and glaucoma these nerve fibers got they succumbed to the pressure and they they died off so now there is a drop out zone of nerve fibers over here so it's important to examining examine the nerve fiber layer also to look for any of these wedge wedge shaped defects or any drop out areas so here as i mentioned you can see that th this area is white here it's dark and here it's white that's normal but here if you look there is a area of darkness over here this is where the nerve fiber layers have dropped out and the rest of it is normal so moving forward now the retinal or optic disc hemorrhages now optic disc hemorrhages are seen mainly in patients with uh, normal tension glaucoma so any time you see a optic disc hemorrhage like this you might it may be as small as this or as large as this one or even tinier like this one you should always suspect normal tension glaucoma in spite of the patient having a normal iop they still have some amount of disc damage that is happening and you should always follow them up closely and maintain the iop at a at, at the lower range of normal somewhere between 12 to 14 now why is optic nerve uh, nerve head hemorrhage is important so optic nerve head hemorrhages are precursors to rnfl dropout zones so if i see a if i see a optic nerve head hemorrhage over here maybe 2 months later i'll find that this area has a rnfl dropout zone because the rnfls were because the pressure of the eye the high pressure has affected this area so much that it's caused a bleeding it's obvious that the underlying rnfl has also succumbed to that same pressure and it will drop out in this area so any time you see a, a disc hemorrhage like this you should always expect to see a rnfl loss a few months down the line in that same area now moving to the region of peripapillary atrophy so around the optic disc in many glaucoma patients as you can see in this image on the on the right you see this area of peripapillary atrophy so it's divided into two zones one is the alpha zone which is the outer zone of peripapillary atrophy it's lighter in color it's sometimes less obvious to the to to see unless you have been looking for it for many years like any glaucoma specialist it's easy to find it but if you are a student or something you might find it a little difficult it takes a little effort to find however the beta zone which is a more obvious zone and here you can see the beta zone over here is a it's it's a paler more dull and uh, it gives it gives it a more uh, distinct uh, appearance as compared to the rest of the retina like the contrast between the beta zone and the rest of the retina is very stark so you can identify and delineate the beta zone and that is the zone of the optic nerve the peripapillary area of the optic nerve that is important for the for glaucoma people to uh, to rule out glaucoma 
so how does the beta zone uh, how does the beta zone prognosticate glaucoma basically the width of the beta zone directly corresponds with the thinning of the neuroretinal rim so the areas where the neuroretinal rim has been damaged more and is more thin those areas will have a larger beta zone so here you can see inferiorly the beta zone is slightly broader that means the rim is also slightly thinner in that area and here you can see the beta zone is slightly thinner so the neuroretinal rim is not going to be as badly damaged as the neuroretinal rim inferiorly so the width of the beta zone is important to prognosticate what kind of uh, disc damage has happened